characterized in some articles as the most important unknown person in D.C., and that's certainly not true because uh, Sally Yates, uh, uh, who was Deputy Attorney General, and then Rod Rosenstein, who's the current deputy, really did depend on uh, Scott Schools for advice and counsel. Uh, he comes from a nearby state here. He was an assistant United States attorney in South Carolina, uh, and then he took, had a stint as U.S. attorney in San Francisco, and he's a graduate of the University of Texas School of Law. Let's give Scott Schools a nice welcome. Scott? Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be back in the South. Um, in San Francisco, when you're walking the streets, you're frequently confronted with the pungent odor of marijuana, and it's, I don't miss it, so it's good to be back. <laughs> Um, I thought rather than me drone on for, with introductions about our, our, pan, our distinguished panelists, um, we, we talked yesterday and decided that each of them would give you a little of their own brief background. So we'll start on my left with the U.S. Attorney from the Northern District of Georgia, B.J. Pack. Good afternoon. Um, my name is B.J. Pack. I'm the U.S. Attorney for uh, Northern District of Georgia. Welcome to the Northern District, those of you from out of town. Um, I lead an office of about 103 AUSAs and about 103. 15 or so support staff. Um, I, I, I've been in this role since October 10th of last year, so I'm approaching one year anniversary. Next is uh, Charlie Peeler from the Middle District of Georgia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charlie Peeler, U.S. Attorney in the Middle District of Georgia. If you're not familiar uh, with the Middle District, it kind of runs diagonally across uh, the state, starting in the southwest uh, corner down in Albany, which is my home, uh, all the way to the north. Uh, east corner in Athens, which was my home for seven years uh, in college and uh, in law school. Uh, we have uh, right at 30 uh, assistant U.S. attorneys, um, and uh, we have offices, main offices in Macon. We have branch offices in Columbus and Albany. Great. Next on my right is Craig Carpenito from the District of New Jersey. How you doing, I, guys? I'm the uh the carpet bagger on this panel, I guess, from up north. But um, I, I'm, I'm an extended family member because right before I was U.S. Attorney in New Jersey, I was with Alston and Byrd um, in their New York office, not Atlanta. But um, you know, the New Jersey office is about now up to about 165 AOSAs. We also have um, some strike force folks resident in the district, uh, and I've been in since January, so it's about nine months in the job. And to Craig's right is Grin Ben Greenberg from the Southern District of Florida. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ben Greenberg. I'm the U.S. Attorney uh, for the Southern District of Florida uh, for, I think, about seven more days. So if we, if we go a little bit late, then I might not be the U.S. Attorney by the time we finish. Um, we have approximately 200 lawyers. Um, we, our district runs from uh, Key West all the way to Fort Pierce, which is about a third of the way up uh, the state on the East Coast. Thanks, guys, and uh, look forward to working with you over the next hour and a half. You know, I, when I first saw the agenda, I thought, Craig Carpenito from New Jersey is coming to the Southeastern Wa uh, White Collar Crime, Crime Conference. I had missed that announcement that Jer New Jersey was not part of the Southeast. <laughs> I, guess, I guess when Rutgers becomes a part of the Southeastern Conference, we'll know for sure that it's official. <laughs> um, so I want to start out by talking just real broadly about white collar crime in the Department of Justice. Guys, uh, I've heard the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General uh, talk a lot about immigration and a lot about opioids and a lot about violent crime and not so much about white collar crime. Um, I did note that in a speech that the DAG gave at the ABA conference, he said that in 2017, main justice fraud section prosecutors convicted 234 individuals, uh, concluded 10 corporate resolutions, and that the 2017 results exceed the prior year in both the number of convictions and monetary, and s monetary sanctions. That's the fraud section, but I'm curious, and I'm sure folks here would be curious to know, what's the message coming from Maine Justice about white collar crime enforcement, and how are you implementing that in your districts? And I think we'll just go district by district, and Craig, since you missed the meeting, you get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, in New Jersey, we have a long history of substantial white collar prosecutions. Um, and it was the bulk of our docket in the prior administration. I think what we heard from Justice was consistent when we came on board. Um, violent crime was up, street crime was up, and we were to allocate our resources accordingly. But the DAG has been steadfast in his message to us that 
given the new resources that have been pushed out from Maine Justice, which I don't know how many of you know this, but there were over 300 additional AUSAs added nationwide and allocated to the various offices because of need. Um, the expectation is that we are going to maintain our focus on white collar crime and there's no reason why we should see a dip there. Uh, in New Jersey, we've doubled down basically by forming pods, grouping together units and trying to use resources and keep them nimble. Um, we for the first time we formed a cyber unit which is staffed with six AUSAs full time. Um, we put that in a pod, connecting it together with our economic crimes unit, um, our healthcare government and financial frauds unit, and um, ARMLU, which is our asset forfeiture and asset recovery unit. And um, we've also welcomed in resources for Maine Justice. I think it's important at times like this when we are strapped for cash, and the government always is, as Scott knows, um, that we share resources and we have a very good relationship with Maine Justice and the current acting chief of the fraud unit, Sandra Moser, has sent several attorneys up to New Jersey uh, in the Medicare strike force that we're able to maintain our focus on white collar crime, which is the clear message from the DAG's office, but also allocate some new resources to the street crime. Ben, you guys in Southern Florida have a bit of a health care problem down there, health care fraud problem. Is that still ongoing? Has anything changed and what are you guys doing in white collar crime generally? We, um, yeah, we still unfortunately have a, a massive healthcare fraud problem in South Florida, um, and, and it's also changed. I think the, the, the schemes have gotten more complex. The dollar amounts have uh, grown. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to attack it from different angles, uh, either money laundering uh, or other fraud statutes. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have is sober home issues in the northern part of our district, um, which are basically places where recovering addicts can live. Um, and theoretically get treatment, um, but either they're not getting the treatment at all or they're not getting the treatment that they're being billed for, um, and so you have millions and millions of dollars in fraud uh, in those cases, and those cases have uh, a tangible real effect because you have patients that are uh, at least potentially getting harm. So, you know, and I would agree with Craig, we really haven't um, taken the foot off the pedal in the fraud area. Um, I, I think, you know, if you were ever in a world, you know, a binary world where you had to choose between doing, you know, a single fraud case and a single violent crime case, um, yeah, then I think that, the, you know, the priority would be on the violent crime case. But um, we, we do the most cases, not the most cases, but the most important cases that we can with the resources that we have, and, and I, think, um, I think that's gonna continue. Uh, BJ, in the Northern District of Georgia, what's what's happening there on white collar crime, and, and in particular, um, kind of flesh out also whether <clears throat> whatever message you're getting from from Washington is sort of with respect to a particular type of white collar crime, or if you as the U.S. Attorney are sort of left to develop a program to address white collar crime that fits your district. So far, uh, Maine Justice and the DAG has not told us to focus on a particular type of white collar crime, but in the Northern District, um, I think um, we've always been pretty active in the healthcare fraud arena, and um, internally, we spent about 40% of our AUSA time working on white collar matters. Now, that, that may not mean that you get more indictments or charges, it just means that we're spending a lot of resources there. Uh, what we're working on, obviously, is the speed in which the, the cases move. Um, that has several factors. Now, from the Washington perspective, and in, according to the DAG, he is very focused on making sure that we do have a robust uh, enforcement um, activity in the white collar space. I do think that, uh, apart from kind of what Craig has said, you know, our, we need to take care of the uh, the violent crime, and the opioids. But the next kind of turning point, I think, is white collar enforcement. There, there are two reasons I say that. One is um, I have the pleasure to serve on a, um, a subcommittee of AGAC on the white collar crime because I know the, the internal discussions right now, so I know we're very focused on it. Secondly, um, I don't know if you guys have kind of noticed this, it, kind of, it was very quiet. In mid-July, the president signed an executive order creating a new financial task force that replaced the old one that was set up in uh, 2009. And I know for a fact that the Deputy Attorney General who is designated to be the chair of that financial task force is in the process of actually forming it um, in, in terms of having U.S. attorneys and various agencies um, designees. And so I think you're gonna see some more um, activity in terms of guidance and, and kind of pro enforcement priorities going forward. 
Charlie, I, I cut my teeth in a district not much bigger than your district. What are the white collar priorities in a district the size of the middle district? Uh, most of our white collar um, prosecution efforts are focused in the healthcare fraud uh, arena. If you look at kind of messaging from the department as a way of, uh, of identifying priorities and, and tracking resources, uh, in June of this year, the department uh, announced a national healthcare fraud takedown, 600 individuals, $2 billion uh, in loss. Um, and so we certainly have um, contributed uh, in part to that. Um, one thing that we've done recently um, in trying to balance resources between uh, violent crime initiatives and white collar fraud is um, there's a higher level of coordination between criminal and civil um, in our uh, office now than there has been in the past. And then we also uh, coordinate uh, with the state AG's uh, office to leverage some of those resources to um, fight primarily in the healthcare fraud space. Charlie, in, a, in an office the size of yours, if you reallocate resources, you certainly can have a big impact on the outcome. Um, you know, if, if Craig, Craig's got 160 lawyers, if he moves one lawyer from healthcare fraud to violent crime, maybe nobody notices. That's not true in your office. Has the, has the emphasis on violent crime and opioids and immigration caused you to pull back resources from white collar, or are you maintaining pretty much the same configuration? We, um, I think initially, uh, you know, in the kind of the first uh, six months when I uh, was uh, in the position, there was a very heavy emphasis uh, on setting up some infrastructure that would allow us to move violent crime cases quicker and ultimately with um, fewer hours and, and less resources. But we kind of got those initiatives underway. Uh, and so there's now some folks who were pulled over to do that are going back to more uh, traditional white collar things. Um, Craig mentioned that the department uh, rolled out 300 uh, new AUSA positions at the beginning uh, of the summer. And so um, our office received uh, a new violent crime prosecutor, uh, a new ACE prosecutor, affirmative civil enforcement prosecutor, and a new immigration prosecutor. So from that standpoint, we're up net uh, three. Um, so. Uh, that's that's a good position to be in. Is that a similar experience for the rest of you? Have you gotten more more resources for white collar? Actually, although the priorities seem to maybe would would have suggested otherwise. Yeah, I think the fraud section has been really cooperative, and that's been very helpful. Um, they've sent us three prosecutors for the Medicare strike force, and I think we're going to be getting more given the data that we're seeing in New Jersey, because we have the pharma corridor there, and we also have a very similar problem to Southern District of Florida. But I, I think really what that the impact has been is the, the incoming folks that we've hired, in particular the folks that we're bringing in in New Jersey are experienced prosecutors from county prosecutor's offices. We've been able to move some of our more senior folks in those units over to cover the white collar spots. So I think the, the additional resources have more than allowed us to keep our focus and not let the white collar prosecutions drop. Okay. Let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit and talk about uh, what, what the department's doing policy-wise. Um, Every deputy attorney general has his or her memo, typically. We had the Philip memo that created the Philip factors. Way back in the day, we had the Thompson memo. We had the McNulty memo. We've had the Yates memo. Uh, Rod Rosenstein, I, as I understand it, has actually been more amb ambitious, and he's revamping the entire U.S. Attorney's Manual. <laughs> I don't know that the intention is to call it the Rosenstein, Rosenstein Manual. We're going to call it the school's manual. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> um, but... Uh, Let's talk specifically about the Yates memo. When it came out, I know there was some discussion about it earlier here. It came out. I was in the I was in the private bar where you guys are, and there was a fair amount of debate at that time about how significant it was going to be in terms of how you practice, and then also debate I think within the U.S. Attorney community about how the department would practice. Um, BJ, is is the Yates memo still alive and well, and does it matter? So far, it is. Um, that's. The Yates Memo is still under review for incorporation into the U USAM, and um, the DAG has been um, pretty open about the fact that it's undergoing review. I have, unfortunately have anything to report other than that, but I, I can tell you I think what's on public, and, and one of the most important things I think people are, there are two, probably, two areas that are probably very important to white collar defense lawyers. One is what is the change going to look like? but. I do think that it's, it's out in public that the individual focus, the investigation focusing on the investigation of individual, I don't think that's going to change. 
and the Deputy Attorney General has been very consistent in that message. And the second thing, the bigger question I think is what's going to happen with cooperation credit in relation to, um, you know, corporate organizations. And that's the million dollar question. Uh, we just have to wait to see. Then I'm, I'm going to ask you to read tea leaves. Um, if you look at what the department has done in sort of the white collar space, there's been the no piling on policy. Um, there's been a, a couple of other policies, the, the no third party settlement policy, which at least from one perspective could be seen to be business friendly. Um, you anticipate a Yates memo amendment that would move kind of in a more business friendly direction? You know, I, I, the truth is I, I, I don't know. Um, I think that if, if that were to happen, it would definitely be in the, uh, you know, in the cooperation area that, that BJ is talking about. Um, I think that in some ways, uh, when you speak about cooperation, that there is always or potential, potentially uh, there's a gap between um, the perception of the memo um, and what's actually in the memo. And sometimes um, I think that there is a, a panic or a concern that things are going to change in such a dramatic way, and then uh, they really don't. And I think that um, that tends to happen a lot in the white collar space. I don't think that that's not a criticism. I just think that's sort of a, a natural thing if that's different than if you're talking about in violent crime and, and the memo says charge it this way or file this enhancement, um, that's much more, much more tangible. Um, and I also don't think that, as BJ said, I agree 100% that the focus on the individuals is ever going to change. But again, like with anything else, um, you know, the memo says focus on the individuals, consider individuals, um, but in the end of the day, you have to follow the facts where, where they are. And so um, in our office, we are when the Yates memo came out initially, um, you know, we really sort of made sure the prosecutors, both on the criminal and civil side, were documenting what they had done to identify individuals who could possibly be held accountable. A lot of times that just meant saying, well, look, here's what the evidence is, and there's no uh, evidence of individual, well, there may be some evidence of individual wrongdoing, but not enough to charge. Um, I don't think that'll, I don't think that'll change, and I, and I don't think it should. You were, you were in a leadership position in the office pre-Yates and post-Yates. Do you think it made much difference in terms of who got prosecuted? No. In, in South Florida, no, definitely not. Craig, what's your, what's your guess about the Yates memo and where it's headed, or how is it impacting prosecutions in New Jersey, if at all? Sure. I, I was at the firm when Yates memo came out, and from my perspective, I didn't see it as a great revelation. You know, we, we still investigate cases in the government the same way. We investigate corporate investigations through individuals. We always looked at individual conduct. You learn about the cases by reviewing individuals' documents, talking to individuals, finding out what roles people played, getting the, the, the larger picture. Um, when I was in the department my first run from 2003 to 2008, I was in a corporate task force slot, and that was the Enron WorldCom send an era of corporate fraud, where we were looking at corporations for accounting fraud, right, versus the financial uh, crisis fraud that was going on during the Obama administration. And I, I grew up in the Bush 43 Department of Justice focusing on individuals, and what did we do then? What we did was we prosecuted the individuals that were responsible for the corporate fraud. We didn't come in and hit the company and have the company repay the debts of the problems caused by those individuals because we were taught that that was punishing the shareholders twice. First with the market drop when the fraud was uncovered and the second time by having the company pay the debt of the individual who charged the fraud. I always was a little perplexed when I was out on the other side when I saw the approach with regards to the financial crisis by the Obama administration department where they were hitting the institutions which we all know if an institution pays a fine they don't pull it out of the employees pockets right the directors pockets the officers pockets that's money that is shareholder money that is just coming right off the bottom line so I thought what they were doing was charging the shareholder twice for the same you know the same impact the same financial fraud so I didn't view the Yates memo as some great revelation I viewed it sort of as a return to the norm if you go back to the 80s the 70s the 90s we always prosecuted the individuals that were responsible for the crimes I thought it was more of a call to and a response to the criticism that that department faced that they were instead doing the opposite and charging the shareholders twice for the same thing. So to me, I think the AIDS memo has sort of been the baseline. We saw an anomaly for a few years because of financial crisis and, and the call for the big banks to pay back 
what people viewed was money that, quite frankly, we would have never collected from individuals. You know, I, I prosecuted Walter Forbes for the Sendent fraud, which was the largest fraud in history at the time. We got a $12 billion judgment. No one's getting that money back, yeah. right? So I, I think there was sort of a reversion um, back to the norm at the Yates Memorial, but that was it. Charlie, your, your district is sort of reflective of a lot of districts in the southeast because a lot of the states are chopped up into smaller districts where they've got 30 to 50 lawyers. Um, when I was a new AUSA and Bart Daniel was my first U.S. attorney, he used to always say, corporations don't go to jail, go after the individuals. Is, is that the approach in your district, or what is the approach, and does Yates have any impact in a district of your size as well? Uh, from a practical standpoint, in our district, um, Corporate investigations are largely centered on kind of uh, medium-sized companies where uh, the shareholder is the decision maker. And so some of the arguments that are frequently available to the defense bar to um, argue that, you know, that um, individual uh, culpability is not there, that individuals shouldn't be prosecuted, doesn't really exist when you've got uh, a company that is set up where, you know, there's no real concern that, uh, hitting the company is going to um, take money out of the shareholder because typically the shareholder is the person that's the wrongdoing. So our investigations involve both. I, I can't think of really any um, in recently in our district where there was um, a corporate defendant but not individual um, defendants as well. Great. Um, okay, let's let's move on to a policy that's sort of not directly relevant to white collar enforcement but has relevance to your resources. Um, I've, I've heard the department's immigration to policy described as a zero tolerance policy. Um, is is that really what it is? And, and Ben, what's what's the immigration enforcement in Southern Florida look like? And is it sucking up a lot of your resources? Um, it takes up uh, some resources, but but not an overwhelming amount of resources. Um, you know, a lot of those cases tend to be uh, straightforward cases. Um, you know, not a whole lot of investigation. <coughs> Not that many trials um, because of the, the you know strength of the evidence. Um, I think that you know zero tolerance. I think you know can apply in two ways. The first is um, you know having zero tolerance in terms of sort of overall immigration uh, immigration policy, not just criminal law. Um, and secondly, there are some districts that have what could be called a zero tolerance uh, criminal enforcement policy meaning that they're prosecuting uh, the misdemeanors. And those are primarily the southwest border uh, districts, which uh, obviously South Florida is not. Um, the, the way that I would describe it in our district is we have um, always had a robust criminal immigration, immigration enforcement docket. Um, that hasn't really changed. I mean, the cases have increased because there are more agent resources on those cases. Um, they have increased because the Attorney General has said he wants this to be a priority, and, and, and that makes it something that, that, that we have to do. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't call it uh, I wouldn't call it zero t zero tolerance. Is is there a workforce worksite enforcement component to the immigration policy? In your view? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the um, the homeland security investigations um, um, side is actually that's one of their top, top priorities. Workforce enforcement, as you know, um, those of you who represent some employers that require some manual labor, you get caught up on the immigration uh, side and you have some uh, alien harboring charges and things like that. And so that's kind of what we're focused on to align our resources. Uh, we're actually in our office have pretty much have um, exhausted all the referrals of 1326 cases that, they're, that ICE is sending us. So above and beyond that, we're fo trying to focus our new allocated slot. We got one of those um, slots designated for immigration enforcement to us, so we're looking at more towards the document side of the f uh, immigration and also workforce enforcement. Um, in addition to um, things like um, you know trafficking, you know labor trafficking and things like that. So that's what our office focused on. Greg, I, I know in the southeast we don't deal too much with sanctuary cities. Is that a problem for you in immigration enforcement? And has it negatively impacted your relationship with law enforcement? So we, we have one declared sanctuary city in Jersey, and we have a couple that are not declaring it, but essentially in operation acting as sanctuary cities. The, the relationships with law enforcement, thankfully, have really not been infringed. Um, where we see the issues is in the, in the political side. There's a lot of pressure in New Jersey not to prosecute those cases. 
We have a clear directive. We're making those cases. Um, from my perspective, where I've put in the most effort, it's on education about what the right way is to approach them. What we're trying to explain to the folks in these sanctuary cities and these politicians who are out there um, campaigning basically on a platform against the administration is that all you do by ha instructing the sheriff's officers in County XYZ in New Jersey not to honor an ICE retainer and release someone is you create a potentially dangerous situation versus the safe transfer of a defendant. The other thing that they're doing inadvertently is they're, they're usually looping in additional targets for ICE because the people who are coming and showing up to pick those folks up when they get pulled over a mile down the road um, by the ICE agents who know a person's being released, they get a whole car full of people that are, you know, are immigrants and that are now subject to the same sort of process. Um, but our big problem is with violence, to, to be frank. I mean, we're, we're very concerned about these protesters that are approaching ICE agents that are trying to find, you know, form human shields around people that are being released where a uh, sanctuary city is not honoring a detainer. So I think the biggest impact so far, we thankfully, knock on wood, have not had an incident where an officer's been, officer been hurt. We have had officers assaulted, and we've had to prosecute those cases. Um, but I think the biggest impact right now, the best we can do is educate people as to why this is a bad idea. This, uh, this issue sort of gives us a chance to segue into an issue that I, we won't dwell on, but I thought we ought to mention a little bit, and that is whether what's happening in Washington matters in your offices. Um, if we take immigration, for example, the president commuted a 40-plus year sentence of, Ms. of Rabbi, former Rabbi Rubashkin, who was operating a kosher meat plant with hundreds of illegal aliens. Um, the president commuted his sentence. You could argue that that's a contradictory message to what the, his own White House has said about immigration enforcement and certainly what the Attorney General has said about immigration enforcement. And we've kind of been in a period where both from the White House and from Congress, there's been lots of criticism of the FBI and the DOJ. Charlie, does it matter on the ground? Um, I'm happy to report that it does not affect the day-to-day -day of what we're trying to accomplish in the Middle District uh, of Georgia. We've got three cities uh, in our district that have homicide rates that are above the national average. That's the top priority. Uh, the folks who are working on that are not distracted by what uh, comes out of Washington. Um, we've got a new um, assistant U.S. attorneys in, as I mentioned, in the fields of um, affirmative civil enforcement, immigration, and violent crime. Those folks are blowing and going and hard charging and, and not affected. So from, from what I um, see in our office, it really is, is not standing in the way of what we're trying to get accomplished. BJ, one of your predecessors is Sally Yates. Um, she's now a private citizen and, and is occasionally tweeting her comments about what, the, what she sees from the White House. Any impact in your office, any of that? No, and even, I know you brought up the example of pardon and things like that. Um, you know, the AUSAs in the office really, it doesn't matter to them whether or not what's going to happen at the end. If the case needs to be brought, if it's the right thing to do and the facts justify it, we do that. If the president or the judge decide to, you know, vary from what we think is a fair sentence or, you know, eventually end up in a pardon, that's not really our lane. Our lane is to enforce the law and the facts and allocate the resources accordingly to the, uh, in accordance with the priorities of the uh, department. Craig, you're probably in the bluest state of anybody up here. Any, how, does it, how does it impact New Jersey? I mean, thankfully, we've stayed out of the fray. I mean, you find the common grounds for any of the, the public part of the job, and violent crime is a real issue in New Jersey, and that's a, you know, that is a nonpartisan issue, right? There is nobody out there who doesn't think we should be addressing the street crime. Um, we've partnered with um, Governor Murphy's Attorney General's office. Kabir Graywall has actually given us a few special assistant U.S. attorneys to work full-time in my opioid unit. We formed an opioid unit when I first came on board because we have a real problem, right? It is a true epidemic in, in every sense of the word. So we've put a lot of resources to that. We've been able to partner there. Um, and we're just not going to get off mission. You know, the, the, the mission is clear for the department, and we stay in our lane, and we just stay out of the press and out of the fray. Ben, let's, uh, let's pivot to a policy that's new in the new administration that can, could potentially have an impact on morale or not, and that is uh, Attorney General Sessions issued a new charging memo in which he kind of reverted to what's usually called the Ashcroft model, where the, where the default is that prosecutors are, are uh, asked to charge the most serious, readily provable offense. Um, 
That memo came out, I think, in March or May of this of 2017. May, I think it was. Um, any any big impact on your operations, and do do people? How do people in the U.S. Attorney's offices react to sort of the the flip floppy policy on whether we're going to default to the most serious or we're going to have to justify the most serious? Well, it's interesting because you have, um, you know, when each time there's a change in administration and there's one of these memos that comes out, you have uh, AUSAs in the office who think the policies are great, and then you have the other group that says, oh, these policies are terrible, and then the same thing happens, you know, a, a, every couple of years. People seem to forget what happened the preceding election. Um, you know, I think most people, most people, not all, um, understand that you know, two things, and they, they kind of work in different ways. Um, the first is that an AUSA is, is working for the United States. You know, nobody gets hired by, I mean, other than, um, not me, but the three uh, distinguished gentlemen to my left. Um, you know, nobody in the office is a political appointee. Um, they work for the Department of Justice, and they don't work for one party or one ideology. Um, but at the same time, people realize that, you know, elections have consequences, and that's the prerogative of a president and an attorney general. And so initially when the memos came out, this was the Sessions memo this happened with, people had, um, you know, either, you know, the sky is falling or the sky is doing whatever the opposite of falling is. <laughs> and then when we sort of digested it, we said, okay, look, let's look at where this is gonna matter. And in, in, in South Florida, um, yeah, it affects certain cases. There's no question about it. But it doesn't affect nearly as many cases as people think primarily because um, you know, we have a pretty substantial drug practice and they're pretty significant players that we're prosecuting getting pretty significant sentences under anybody's memo. Um, and so it, it, it has this, again, this sort of, people have a visceral reaction to it, but in the end of the day, um, yeah, I could give a list of cases where it did have an impact on charging or sentencing, um, but far less than I think anybody, anybody would assume. BJ, what about in the white collar space? Should folks in this room expect to hear from an AUSA? You know, I, I, I can't, I'm gonna have to have you plead to that wire fraud charge because that's the most serious readily provable offense. Is, does it really work in that area? I think um, for, for statutes that then have mandatory minimums, it has very little effect. Um, in white collar space particularly, I mean, the question then becomes, can you charge bargain a little bit? Uh, in public corruption sphere, that happens all the time, particularly, you know, um, instead of a wire fraud, uh, a lot of times they'll ask for a 371 uh, conspiracy count, capping at five years. Um, and then you have much more flexibility in terms of the guidelines and loss amounts, in particular role and things like that. So I don't think it's applied or the impact of the new memo uh, has any bearing on kind of how we at least handle white collar um, cases. Uh, in, in, the, in the drug and the um, violent crime side, when you do have mandatory minimums and consecutive sentences, um, I think you do run into that problem. Uh, but the memo, I think, and I, I don't know, some people may disagree, although it tells you to charge all man mens that, that, that you could reasonably prove and, um, and charge the most serious and rarely provable offense, the resolution side, however, I think gave the prosecutors more discretion uh, in the context of the person wants to uh, you know, cooperate or uh, in a situation you think whether it's a reasonable sentence, <coughs> Uh, you could even come below that, even though they don't qualify for safety valve or things like that. The memo, I think, gave more discretion to line prosecutors to define what is appropriate and resolve it for the, for the, uh, for the right reason. And the Attorney General has always said that it's not about getting the maximum amount of sentence, it's about getting a sentence, um, particularly in the violent crime area, to make sure that that dangerous person's off the street. So he never says, you know, try to lock them up as long as you can. Actually, the policy, the policy says opposite. Look, let's go back to the way it was and the policy-wise, and then we're gonna give you more discretion to resolve the case. There's a little bit of growing pain, I think, because a lot of the AUSAs that are currently in the office um, were hired under the previous, uh, the Holder Memo and charging policy, so there was a little bit of a learning curve in doing things a little bit differently. But overall, I think that it's more of a positive de development all practitioners and not something uh, that adds more uh, bureaucracy or control from D.C. Charlie, how about in, uh, in middle Georgia? How does that policy impact your decisions generally and in particular the white collar space? Well, I, it's been very well received in my discussions with the career prosecutors uh, in our office. You know, they, they view in the violent crime space, uh, in the drug space, the ability 
to charge um, offenses with mandatory minimums as another kind of arrow in their quiver. And so it gives them ultimately uh, more control over the prosecution um, from the beginning. Um, and so it's been very well received. In the white collar space, um, I don't know that it affects uh, much. You know, we, um, like most districts, have a policy where uh, every uh, indictment is preceded by a prosecution memo. Uh, a part of the prosecution memo includes doing the math in white collar cases to uh, estimate what a sentencing range would be. Um, and so that has continued. And I think that folds in with kind of the goals of the memo, but uh, it doesn't affect too much more than that. Craig, I want to follow up on that point, something BJ said about your district in a blue state. He mentioned that some of the folks who are applying the new Sessions policy were hired in the Obama administration and would have cut their teeth on the smart on crime policy and um, may, may have come to work at the department because they liked what the administration was doing. My recollection from my time in the department from being hired back in the day is that who hired you didn't really matter very much. Um, does, it, does it matter in New Jersey and or, or is it harder as a U.S. attorney in today's environment to manage employees who were hired by one administration or the other? Is it, is it making an impact on, on your recruitment? Do you see certain types of AUSAs coming looking for jobs in New Jersey? So I haven't seen a difference in recruitment because the job is just one that so many people want to do and they want to get into the office and they understand the politics change. So I think we're seeing phenomenal candidates and I haven't really seen a dip there. When I got into the office, what I think was um, an issue was a communication issue on trying to communicate that to them that changing to a new administration, changing from Smart on Crime to PSN 2.0, changing from the Holder memo to this, the Sessions memo, um, is not about a criticism of the prior administration or the job that they did while they were operating under the prior administration. Deciding to take a new directive is not a criticism of the job that they had been doing for the past some up to eight years. It is a new directive because we have new leadership in Washington, D.C., and the department, like every other agency within government, as Bruce said earlier, is ever-evolving and ever-changing. And all we do, our job, is to seek justice, right? It's not the department of the Democratic Party. It's, it's not the department of the Republican Party. It's not the department of we win cases. It's the department of justice, and it could not be clearer. And sitting down early and often and talking to the, the office every time we had a swearing in or an all hands and trying to explain that I was proud of them that they were evolving to the new PSN 2.0 model or proud of them for doing more immigration cases or proud of them for doing this. But when I compliment them, I'm not saying I thought you were doing it wrong. And, and I do think that that takes a lot of effort when you see a change in party to try and keep those people there who may have been attracted to the department because they like the policies of the prior administration, but also like being career prosecutors. They don't want to lose them. Got it. One of the, uh, Ben, one of the uh, initiatives of the Deputy Attorney General's efforts to revamp the USAM is he has been frustrated over the years about the department's methodology of sort of policy by memo, and if you're an assistant U.S. attorney trying to figure out what a particular policy has been in a certain subject matter area, sometimes Google is your best friend, that you go Google the memo and you find it that way, instead of being able to go to the U.S. Attorney's Manual as sort of a, a one-stop shop. His, his ambition is to change that, and so one of the side effects of that is some of the policies that they're announcing are now included in the, memo, in the US, U.S. Attorney's Manual and readily available to everybody in this room because it's a public document. <clears throat> one of the new provisions is what's been referred to as the no piling on policy in white collar space. So. Um, essentially, the, the gist of it, as I understand, is that the department's going to both coordinate internally and when it can externally to make sure that subjects of white collar investigations, who I, I think this will primarily affect, are not being double dipped or not being double hit. Um, I know from my own experience, for example, if you ever represent a financial institution and you've done anything that that uh, has caused anybody's interest, it's going to cause the interest of the Fed, the OCC, the CFPB, the CFTC, and the Department of Justice, and that's just in the U.S., and then you have problems abroad as well. Um, what's your take on the no, no piling on policy and how uh, it will, if at all, really impact the work that's going on in the U.S. Attorney's offices? So I think it'll if the direct impact in the U.S. Attorney's office as I see it, um, is going to come in cases where there are, uh, you know, parallel proceedings 
Um, for us, that's going to be primarily in, in the healthcare fraud area, some in the securities fraud area, um, because you, you sort of have these two competing ideas. There is, the, there is an emphasis um, and a focus on parallel proceedings and, and you know, doing them when appropriate but and doing them the right way and those sorts of things. But you know, the more agencies that you have, civil and criminal or within the criminal sphere, um, the more likely you're going to have more agencies that want a piece of the pie. And, and look, there's a reality to it, which is that um, the agencies want their work to be reflected in the amount of money that comes back to them, either for their agency or to break off pieces for local agencies. Um, so you have those two things um, that, are, that are kind of at play. So from the U.S. Attorney's point of view, I see it internally, um, probably with our own um, civil divisions, potentially. Um, and I that you mentioned, I mean, financial institutions is going to be number one in that area. Um, you have some types of healthcare fraud cases where they're going to be state authorities, um, that you're going to have multiple authorities um, involved. Um, but I think, that it, I think that, it, that it makes sense. I think one thing that will happen is um, prosecutors will get a lot of claims at the settlement point, because I really don't think that the policy is saying, um, you, you know, you should be mindful of it when you investigate, but I don't think they're saying that it, that it applies necessarily to um, the investigative part. But when you get to settlement or resolving the case, I think prosecutors um, are going to get hit with an argument of, well, this is, you know, $60 million is, is, is you're piling on because of this, this, and this, and try to bring the amount down. But, you know, that's just another part of negotiation, I think. PJ, if, uh, if I'm a defense lawyer and you're, you're uh, my comp the company I represent is in the sights of your U.S. Attorney's Office and we're trying to negotiate a resolution and some of these other regulatory entities or other offices are involved, if I come to you and say, as part of the negotiation, I want you to go to bat for me with uh, CFPB, for example, and, and let's work out a resolution that doesn't require me to go to them and to you to get this done, is that, uh, is that are you going to be open to that kind of approach? No one has asked that yet. Um, but uh, I think by, by the nature of kind of some of these parallel investigations, um, at least in my, during my tenure in the office, uh, cooperation has been pretty good. The coordination has been pretty good. We haven't had a situation like that. But if a request like that came in and it turns out that we don't have a very good working relations with a particular agency that's looking at a different aspect of it, um, I, you know, I would make the call because the policy does direct us to do that, uh, particularly in the resolution space um, because it became it, it's in the USAM for a reason and the reason being is that not everybody was following, um, particularly with all the DOJ components. Um, only issue that we generally run into in terms of working is um, when you have parallel with some DOJ component. Um, but otherwise, the agencies, at least they're located here, I have no problem calling them up and say, hey, let's get to the table. What is it you, you want, us want? Because we all want the same thing. We want the resolution that's fair for everybody. In the false claim context, I think because the penalties are so high, it's never an issue. And that's the most common um, situation here. Um, but uh, with the Yates memo, I think there's a related situation that occurs is when you have a resolution for the entity and then you have a resolution for the individual. And then there's usually a tension there because they want, they, they're trying to say that we are piling on because this person, for example, is a doctor that owns a certain portion of this huge practice and you're penalizing the practice and then you're going after that. But um, it's never been an issue and I'd be happy to make the call. Charlie, how about in the middle district of Georgia? Do you expect this to be a policy that impacts your practice uh, very often? Um, I don't think that it's going to um, change uh, much of what we do because we already coordinate. Um, and you know, if you look at the, the new policy, uh, it requires the department to consider all relevant factors in determining whether coordination and apportionment between department components and with other enforcement authorities quote, allows the interest of justice to be fully vindicated. So if different uh, departments or agencies, whether they're federal or state or local, if they're all acting uh, with the goal of uh, allowing the interest of justice to be fully vindicated, then that kind of puts the burden on everyone to, uh, to work together to make sure that there's no piling on and that there's a just resolution. So that, that's what we do most of the time. It's in the healthcare fraud space and we're coordinating with the state. Um, yeah, or it's uh, within um, our office, civil and criminal. Craig, I, I think if there's a, anything approaching an emerging theme from this discussion, it is, it is that the departments from Washington, that policies from Washington don't kind of impact what's happening in the U.S. Attorney's offices on the margins, but not that directly. 
that a fair assessment and with respect to the piling on policy, what it sounds like everybody's saying is it's not going to make a huge difference in the way the department handles cases. What's your view? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a very accurate statement. It's part of the theme to going back to your last question where when you're sitting down talking to the AUSAs about the changes in administration, I tried to explain to them as a line assistant what, what's going on in D.C. in a change of administration shouldn't impact your day-to-day -day life. You're working your cases. You're bringing your cases. You're looking for the just result. Um, in New Jersey, we work often with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and actually I was an, a lawyer at the SEC when I came out of law school, and I joined the office as a special assistant, seconded from the SEC before I became a, a line AUSA. Um, when you have these SEC investigations, which is probably our, our most robust um, joint parallel investigation effort, you often also have the other financial um, agencies you're talking about. And prior to this memo, you were doing the same thing. You were sitting and saying, okay, we're going to take the criminal component. You're going to do the civil enforcement side. And what you're usually haggling over is which department is going to be the one that collects the restitution and the forfeiture. And from my experience, it all comes down to who goes first. Um, the SEC is usually very comfortable with those conversations. The CFTC is very comfortable with those conversations. State AG is very comfortable with those conversations. And everybody is staking a claim to it, which is at the end of the day what we know what the agencies care about the most. Uh, it's just whether or not in their release it's going to say that, you know, they've gotten X amount in restitution and they've credited dollar for dollar what came in the criminal case or vice versa. So I do think this has been going on for a long time. I think what we're seeing here is that the department has done a good job and, as you said earlier, um, DAG Rosenstein has done a great job of memorializing a lot of policies that have always been in effect in practice. Okay. One of the policies that's been effect in practice for a long time is the principles on federal prosecution of business organizations. Um, that provision contains what are co been fairly commonly referred to as the Phillip factor. It's after Mark Phillip, who was the DAG at the end of the Bush administration. Um, I was at a conference at one point with one of Craig's predecessors when he was talking about health care enforcement, and he said in his office, the Phillip factor analysis basically boiled down to what did you try to do to stop it and what did you do when you found out about the bad conduct. Um, I'm going to let each of you, if you would, sort of give these folks the inside scoop on what's going on in your office about how you analyze Phillip factors and if you can give them any, any insights into things they should emphasize if they're making pitches to your office or what you yourself would be persuaded by, that would be great. PJ. Um, I think the, the most important thing is kind of the seriousness of the offense, right? We start with that, and then um, what, what changes they made. I think most effective ones that uh, come in and they say, look, we've changed management, we got a new compliance program in, or it's been effective, it's, it's, it's rogue. Some of the other facts that I just don't believe that they're that important, things like the history of, like a criminal history of the corporation, I always thought, if the management had changed, I mean, why would we look at that? Um, but I know some districts, and I think Maine Justice kind of looked at that. But to me, it's more like the seriousness of the offense and what, what have you done to remedy that situation in terms of your compliance program, are you changing leadership, what, what have you done? And, and beyond that, I mean, um, be, beyond those two, I think everything else is kind of equal. Charlie? Uh, the severity of the conduct, um, certainly, and the harm to the public is one that is um, front and center uh, in our office. Um, and then, um, like BJ said, what has been done about it? Um, and did you self-disclose? And how cooperative have you been since this has come on our radar? Those are the ones that I think uh, carry the most weight. Let me follow up on self-disclosure, and I'll give everybody to talk about this as well. But in the, in the USAM under the uh, FCPA provisions, there's fairly specific, relatively specific uh, guidance in there about what's supposed to happen if you self-disclose. Outside of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act space, Charlie, how, do you, how does that weigh in for you? And if, if uh, one of these folks is trying to make a decision about whether to come to your office to disclose some wrongdoing at a corporate client, um, can they, do they, would they expect not to be prosecuted if the conduct is something that hasn't been on your radar? Um, I think that certainly they would be in a position to make a strong argument for that. It's, you know, uh, applying the Phillip factors or the self-disclosure um, 
incentives under FCPA, whatever, it's, it's a very fact-intensive analysis. There, there is no case um, that looks the same, in my view, but certainly that is something um, that I know our office looks at, self-disclosure, uh, and then not just self-disclosure, but how cooperative uh, have you been after uh, it's come on the radar? So um, I think it's important. I think it's very important, and I think that um, folks who counsel their client to do that are doing a very strong service for their clients. Craig, <coughs> Craig how are you uh, evaluating? That was your predecessor, by the way, <laughs> who made that comment, Paul Fishman. Um, how are you evaluating Phillip factors and um, self-disclosure? And I think one of the things that's always trickiest about representing corporate clients and contemplating the self-disclosure um, question is when to do it. And so if you're going to do it, when to do it, and whether to do it before you know what all the facts are, before you've re remediated the misconduct, um, if you're going to make corporate changes in structure or in personnel because of what's gone on, um, you're always sort of running against the clock there. So what, what, what are your thoughts on uh, what, what your office favors and what would be a good approach if, if folks are prosecuting a case in Madrid? Yeah, so def defending a case. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I do think it's it's a case, you have to do a case by case analysis of what the, the right time is to disclose. Sometimes the the disclosure obligation is going to be driven by an external event. Um, in private practice, I represent a lot of folks in accounting fraud cases because of the background I had as a prosecutor, and though in those cases, there's usually something coming up through the accounting firm through the audit committee something where they're going to make an 8K disclosure and that is going to lead to an immediate disclosure to your office because they know you're going to see it anyway, it's out there, they're coming in. And those often happen very early on before they know the extent of the misconduct because it's the, the outside auditor who's saying, hey, we're not going to sign off on your financials. You guys have to put an 8K out there or at least we're going to do it in a way that is, you know, a, um, a, a measured you know, sign off where we're going to note the fact that we've just learned about this and next quarter we're going to give a further update. Um, then you have the old traditional one where maybe a compliance program roots out a problem or something comes in through a hotline. You can't really judge those both the same. You can't give too much credit to the corporation who comes in early on when they are making a financial, a, a public disclosure because what's the real motivating factor? Why are they coming to you so early? They're about to make a public disclosure. They know that they're about to get hit with plaintiff's litigation. They're about to get subpoenas. They say, well, we might as well go in and get credit for self-disclosing. We're about to announce it. A lot of those internal investigations happen because of a compliance report, something a whistleblower uh, sends through. And oftentimes, those investigations lead to a conclusion that nothing wrong occurred. A red flag popped up. They needed to, to, to drill down and decide, was there a problem or was there not a problem? If it, if it turns out that there's not a problem, that's not something they should have reported, and they would have just wasted the department's time and potentially caused numerous other issues, wasted resources, et cetera. Drilling down to figure out if the red flag is more than just a red flag and an actual problem to me is the responsible thing to do. And if you come in and you explain to the department why it is you had to do the investigation first, how it came in, why it was sourced the way that it was, why the responsible thing to do is determine if you had a problem. I don't think a company should be penalized if there's a reasonable basis for them to have investigated first. And I, I think that the other issue we have to address, and, and I think the department's done a good job with under uh, Attorney General Sessions is, there was a perception out there amongst companies coming out of the financial crisis of, the phrase came out, the disappearing credit for cooperation. So it was harder for a company to decide whether or not they were going to come in and make a self-disclosure because there really was no benefit to doing so. Um, one of the things I think you know, New Jersey has been doing, and I've been attending a lot of compliance conferences and um, industry conferences to get the message out there that we are going to judge your, your disclosure fairly and your cooperation fairly, and that the department is steadfast in its belief that companies that do come in self-disclose or cooperate fully once the investigation's in place are going to get the credit for that cooperation. So I think part of that is explaining to them that you don't have to fear, you know, if you didn't disclose to us on day number one that there's going to be no credit at the end of the day. So it really does have to be a balancing test of how the, how the matter came in, 
um, whether it was clear cut that there was a violation or if this was something where it needed to be run down to determine whether or not whether to tip or a red flag was credible and then whether or not there was anything done to obstruct or intentionally not disclose or if they were just disclosing at a certain time because it seemed like the right thing to do. Okay. Ben, how about in Southern Florida? I, I would say it's exactly as, as Craig said. Um, I, don't, I don't have a, a whole lot to add. I, I would just say uh, two things. Um, the first is that, you know, voluntary self-disclosure, we all agree that is incredibly important. But um, the only thing worse than not taking that step is to say that you're voluntarily disclosing things and, ha and you know, bring your client in and have uh, your client not tell the complete truth, um, shade things. And uh, look, I get it. That, that's much easier for a prosecutor to say, well, you know, come in and tell us everything. You know, there are realities to representing these people that, that clearly, um, you know, you all know about more than, than we do up here. Um, but I do think where people have gotten jammed up is if they come in too soon, um, for all the reasons that Craig said, they come in too soon um, and the witness or the person whoever is brought in um, either isn't adequately prepared or, or they're not, you know, they haven't sort of had their epiphany about cooperation yet, a full epiphany, um, and they don't reveal everything and then things get off track. And what I have seen is that, and I, I, I don't imagine this is unique to South Florida, is that once they get off track, um, it can be very hard to get back on track because the perception then becomes, I've heard prosecutors say, oh, this person's not telling the truth, they're not being you know, open about everything, and then um, you know, what could have been avoided maybe by taking a little bit of extra time um, become, you know, spirals into this massive problem. I think Craig raises a great point, and I, I do think sometimes we as prosecutors need to do a better job of this, um, of saying, well, you, know, you need to come in you know, Monday at 9 a.m., well, you know, maybe Thursday at 3 p.m. Um, is going to save a lot of trouble um, because it gives everybody more time to be prepared to see what the problem is um, rather than, ru you know, rushing too fast into this and it's, it becomes a debacle. So I, I mentioned the, uh, the FCPA policy, which I think is new from November of 2017 and included within the USAM and talks about sort of fairly specifically the benefits of self-disclosure. Um, Charlie, any reason to treat other offenses any differently than the FCPA? And if, if one of these folks sort of wants to follow the FCPA model of cooperation in hopes of achieving a similar result in a healthcare fraud case or, or some other white collar case, is that a reasonable approach? Yeah, I think it's good. You know, the FCPA incentives are, are pretty specific with percentages, uh, a specific percentage reduction off the low end of the fine guide uh, range and that kind of thing. So I wouldn't, you know, encourage folks to, to say, hey, use the FCPA and I get a 25% reduction um, for this other offense. But I think it is fair to look at the incentives uh, in the FCPA uh, and um, the Phillip factors and to, I think, with confidence argue uh, your client's uh, position, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis those factors based on whatever facts uh, are apparent in, in your, um, you know, in the, in the specific matter. Now, at the end of the day, um, when you're representing the corporation, uh, you know, one of the factors is, does the corporation um, assist in identifying um, the department to hold the culpable individual uh, responsible? And so that's something that hasn't been talked about in the last round of answers. But that, that's another thing that um, is certainly important, too. So I think it's fair to look at it um, and to argue those factors. Um. We're going to have a little extra time at the end, probably about, we're going to do, talk a little bit about FCA enforcement, so I want to invite you all to ask questions as well if you have them, so please feel free to start thinking up questions if you have them for the panel. Um, but I, I did want to, I know that you've had a panel on FCA enforcement, uh, False Claims Act enforcement, but it, it uh, obviously is probably with the FCPA and the FCA are the, are the two favorite statutes of the people in this room because they make you a lot of money. <laughs> they create a lot of work for you. So Ben, I'll start with you on the False Claims Act. You, you have a, a, a robust health care enforcement practice in, in Southern Florida. Um, in the new administration, anything different about what's happening in the False Claims Act area? What are you doing with respect to resources? Uh, any different directive in terms of how to resolve those? I think, as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you look back at the policies that have been issued relative to white collar enforcement by the administration, 
they are arguably business friendly. Is that going to translate to, to any uh, more lenient results in false claims act cases? I, I don't think so. Um, you know, we have we have uh, had an additional resources in the affirmative civil area, um, and a lot of those folks are doing uh, FCA cases. Um, so I think that's a good indicator of. Um, you know, the department's continued prior prioritization of this area. Um, so I think that will continue. Um, you know, the, the only thing that I, that I have seen, and, and, and the truth is it's more anecdotal, is, um, you know, I think there is a little bit more scrutiny of settlements um, sometimes than there was in the past, and, and, and I don't know that that's uh, attributed to, attributable to any, um, you know, ideological shift. Um, the other memo that, that can sometimes work its way into some of this is, I, I don't remember exactly how it was, it was titled, but it, it was by the associate AG, I think, um, about using policy statements um, and giving policy statements um, you know, more, uh, more substance, more weight than just what a policy statement should have. But, but again, it has, I have not really seen um, that difference. Um, I think we could use more agent resources, honestly, in that. I, I don't know why I'm asking you this, but if, <laughs> you know, um, you know, that's, that's one. We can, I, we can get them a ride if they need exactly, one. Exactly, <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that counts. Um, no, that would be, um, you know, you know, you know, that's always sort of out there, but I haven't seen, I really haven't seen a big change. And again, if you look at where the areas where there have been resources pushed out to the districts, uh, certainly in Miami and, and I'm sure everywhere else, um, it's been uh, violent crime slots, uh, immigration slots, civil and criminal, and uh, affirmative civil enforcement slots. And so, um, you know, that's, that really tells me a, a great deal. You mentioned greater scrutiny of settlements. Which, what kind of scrutiny is it? Is it scrutiny that the settlements are too harsh or not harsh enough or not big enough or, what's, or is it just taking longer? Uh, it's... Nah, I can say whatever I want. I only got seven days left. I guess. <laughs> no, I mean I've heard. I've heard. No, I have heard anecdotally. Um, yeah, a little bit on the on the time that it takes, um, which I think has made people think that it's it's uh, getting more scrutiny. But no, it hasn't. I have not, I've heard nothing that it's um, you know we want higher or we want lower. That that I haven't heard. Craig, what about in New Jersey? Any change in in false claims act enforcement there? There has been a, a large rollout of resources, as Bruce mentioned. Um, and I think the biggest difference that we're seeing overall, certainly from my first go through department, is the data-driven resources that we're getting. I think that in particular on Medicare fraud, um, the data that is being crunched by the Medicare strike force is extremely helpful. It's cutting through a lot of the delay that we normally see in building an FCA case. Because um, as, as many of you know that are out there that's worked on this stuff, um, you know, from a law firm perspective, you have unlimited resources. You can hire consultants. You can get through that data as quickly as you want to. Um, often, the frustration I saw on the other side while I was defending healthcare companies was we were ready to have discussions, and the government wasn't ready because they couldn't get through the data, they couldn't crunch the numbers. I think the resources added um, in the AUSA arena is going to be somewhat helpful, but really the, the game changer is going to be the resources we've seen added by way of these market experts, the data analytics they're getting, um, the additional funding that's available for you to apply for on a case-by-case -case basis when you have a, an FCA case or any sort of civil enforcement case where you think there's a viable return is what's going to make the difference in getting these done faster and better. Uh, BJ, in, in the, there's a obviously great incentives in the False Claims Act for whistleblowers to come forward. Um, which has resulted in a pro proliferation of sort of plaintiffs FCPA, F FCA firms that are bringing lots and lots of cases. Mm -hmm. How does a, a district the size of yours deal with the volume and how do you decide when to jump in and when to, when to not jump in and is that a decision you can make quickly, you try to make quickly and if so, how can folks who are representing healthcare uh, clients mm -hmm. assist that process? We were, we were very, um, we were one of the t top districts in terms of um, recoveries, and also, um, you know, we went around and said we want more of those cases. So the volume's up. Let's put it that way. I can tell you right now, the volume's up significantly. The challenge always, of course, if it's a key TAM, you always have mandatory that we have to actually investigate that, takes resources away. 
So we encourage people to do pre-filing kind of co consultation, and actually that's up too. Because then I send out the ACE attorneys um, out to the speaking circuit, kind of tell them that here's kind of train up some of the, the newer Ketan Bar members so that they know how these things kind of work. That's really helping. Um, in, what I've also done in my office is that I've actually, sh you know, evened up the, the civil division. Uh, I use some of my uh, <laughs> criminal AUSA resources and shift them to civil. So you, can, you know, we have a lot more FT FTEs in, in civil, uh, including enforcement. Um, I, my message to them is bigger, better, faster. Okay, bigger, better, faster. And so we're, gonna, we're very aggressive about looking at cases. Of course, the Cranston memo, we move to dismiss if they're frivolous. And so um, I've given them all the resources to even grow the practice even bigger. And that's how I've, I've done that. There's a couple of things I would like to mention, um, you know, to follow up on Craig's point about the, the data driven. We got to a point that, although we do have a lot of key TAMs, uh, we are at the point that we're self-generating or self-referral of cases because of data. Um, so we're going to have FCA cases that are not key TAM related, but more in terms of here's, uh, here's some fraud activity going on. Particularly with two areas, uh, one of the enforcement areas that the department wants to focus on is elder justice. So we're looking at a lot of nursing homes. Um, secondly is the opioids, obviously prescription pharmacy and things like that. And that has spun off a lot of work in terms of other regulatory violations. Um, and what I wanted to do is uh, devote more resources, leverage the criminal side, and I want to have a parallel investigation on every single FCA case that's in our office. And that's kind of what we've done. The volume is up. Uh, hopefully, I think you may see that, um, you white collar bar. Um, and one other thing from, from the DOJ perspective, the brand memo, I think Craig mentioned that a little bit. Um, oh, actually, Ben mentioned it. The, the, the brand memo that tells us to not rely on guidance documents, um, that's still up to debate on what effect that's going to have. Um, in our office, we, we haven't really changed much based on that. Um, but that is an issue out there that's probably going to impact the white collar bar. The second thing is, um, I think there's been a little bit of a retraction or debate about how aggressive offices should be related to the um, violations of Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act, particularly with off-label promotion, because of the open question about the First Amendment. And so in those two areas, I think we are still kind of waiting to see, depending on what the case is. But otherwise, bigger, better, and faster. Sherwick? I don't have much to add other than, you know, the department has, has pumped resources out uh, to the 94 uh, districts by way of personnel, not just attorneys, um, but uh, also support personnel, making funds available uh, for contractors who can be healthcare fraud investigators. Um, I think everyone is relying on uh, the data, and I don't know, um, I know that in it's fairly recent uh, that the department has openly acknowledged that you know data is being reviewed by particularly in the opioid space how many prescriptions how many patients um, how many days pass um, before death of a patient um, so all of those tools are going to just continue to increase um, Scott you mentioned the relators bar uh, is blowing and going um, they you know they they, they really are um, you know if there's anyone in the room um, that does that type of work, I'll tell you that um, that the manner in which the information is presented does make a difference. Um, it's better to be comprehensive. It's better uh, to be organized. Um, I've been very impressed at the scope of the investigation um, that um, the agency and the folks in our office um, undertake when uh, a key TAM comes in, even if it's one that might not be uh, organized or, you know, might be more of a shotgun type, but folks who can really narrow the issues and who can pick the one, two, or three most promising theories, are, it, it makes a difference. Those are the cases that are more likely uh, to be pursued uh, by the, by, at least by our office. What, one, uh, one last question on the FCA, Ben. Uh, what, is, what is the practice in your district where you have declined to intervene in a case and then settlement negotiations are ongoing with the Relators Council and the defense, the defense attorney for the health care provider. How involved do you get, if at all? And if you're going to get involved, when and why do you do it? Not, not that involved. Um, you know, the, I think somebody on the earlier <coughs> panel was talking about that the, the, you know, it's a relatively small number of cases that we can intervene in. Um, but once we don't, um, 
it, it, it's not a lot. And you know, one of the problems that we, that we have uh, that somebody else mentioned is um, is the time. You know, we, we get we have a very short window in which to make that determination uh, as to whether to intervene. And um, we are, you know, the judges in South Florida, and I don't know why, I'm not really sure why it's happened, but they have gotten, you know, a little more um, stingy with giving continuances and, and giving us a little more time to keep something under seal so we can make uh, a decision. My fear is that there are times that we're, you know, our the default is no because we just don't have the time. And it really is, to, you know, to your point that, you know, that decision, when, you know, the yay or nay decision is really um, this critical moment for us being heavily involved or, or kind of backing away. Um, we'd be remiss if we had a white collar panel and we didn't talk a little bit about public corruption. Craig, one of the most prominent public corruption trials that's happened in the United States recently was the Menendez case that happened in your district. It wasn't your people, but it resulted in uh, an unfavorable result for the department. What's the, what's the message from the from the administration on public corruption? Um, doesn't s seem like we hear a whole lot about it, um, but uh, I'm curious if there is a message from from the administration and sort of how, what it, what's happening on the ground. It, it's one of the enumerated priorities that um, the attorney general gave each of the offices when we had our U.S. Attorney's National Conference this year. Um, political corruption is an enormous problem, and in New Jersey, it's been a particularly bad problem throughout the years. Uh, I think. You know, under Governor Christie, he was 110 and 0, I think, in seven years. And in, in prosecutions, we saw um, Paul Fishman have a lot of success as well in the same arena. I think the reason why we're hearing less about it, Scott, is because the Supreme Court rulings have really narrowed the use of honest services fraud and made it harder for us to get those cases. Um, I think what we saw in the Menendez case, again, my office was not participating in it is the narrowing of that honest services fraud component really making it more difficult to bring a political corruption case unless you can show a direct quid pro quo. And then when you take McConnell and the kind of conduct that I think typically or historically was viewed as that type of quid pro quo and narrowing that even further, I think what we're seeing is sort of a degradation of what used to be the cherished weapon of any political corruption prosecutor. So we've got uh, we've got about ten minutes left. Any anybody have questions that they'd like to ask? We're yes. apply those factors in that situation where there's no parallel criminal action? If not, why not? What do you apply? What do you look at? DJ, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> what factors do you think we should look at? <laughs> I mean, listen, I mean, you could go through this presentation of all the factors and things like that. I think it's, um, you know, we get presentations like, it's cookie cutter, right? They go down the factors and things like that. I don't think that's as effective. The civil division, um, they do look at some factors that are not, they don't look at it in the fill of factors context, but certainly those things do matter. Um, and I think that uh, if you see the trend from the Department of Justice perspective, that they're trying to, the Deputy Attorney General is trying to codify that so it applies to both civil and criminal and to all the DOJ components that you're going to see a little bit more consistency in, in application. But practically speaking, I mean, those factors are all malleable and you can emphasize one or the other. Uh, but in the civil context, I think they still do go through that analysis. It may not be necessarily in those exact order or, or terms of the criminal AUSAs use. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the things I know is part of the U.S. Attorney's manual, manual revision is that it's going to make it clear that it applies throughout the department. I think there's been some lack of clarity about whether the fraud section or the civil division has to comply with uh, the mandates in the U.S. Attorney's Manual. It might even have a name change. I'm not sure. I don't want to. I don't want to let any cats out of the bag. It might already have a name change for all I know. But uh, so. But I think, regardless, it's going to be made clear that it's a justice manual and not just for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yes. Coordination or consistency. 
been you've been you've been around the longest. Why don't you take that one on? Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> look, it, it, so it, it's interesting. I mean, I, there is um, there is not a lot of um, consistency or whatever the, the word is. I, I agree with you. Um, I can tell you what we try to do um, within the office, and, and there's two things, and, and then I have a comment sort of more generally. Um, you know, we set, uh, you know, we have uh, guidelines that we sort of, um, both DOJ memos and sort of the U.S. Attorney sets um, sort of policy and says this is how, you know, the general guidelines of how cases um, should be resolved. Um, obviously, there's going to be some discrepancy. Um, you can't be completely consistent because different cases have different factors and different prosecutors do th view things differently. Um, but we do sort of get, you know, we do sort of preach the same message throughout the district. Um, second, um, a lot of plea agreements that need to be approved, we have those sort of delineated. And, you know, in our office, if it's one of those plea agreements, there's a choke point, um, the, which is, you know, our criminal chief, the criminal chief for the whole district. And theoretically, she's making sure that there's consistency. Um, but I, I agree with you, it is, it's, a, it's an imperfect system. In terms of um, DC's ability to um, ensure that, um, you know, you, you know, I think from the antitrust division, I mean, there are certain areas where um, DC plays a huge role in making sure that there is consistency. The greatest example of that that I can think of is the National Security Division. Um, you know, everything that we do in a plea agreement has to go through, um, you know, either the uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, himself or a deputy. AAG, whoever it is, um, and so what you do see is you have this sort of horizontal equity um, nationwide. There's at least an attempt to do that. Um, but I will tell you this, and, and we're a big district in terms of lawyers. We struggle with it, and I'll talk to defense attorneys, and you know they'll say, "Oh, this same thing. You know, this one offered this plea, this offered the other," and I'm, you know, thinking that ah, that's probably not that's probably not accurate, and then it's it's accurate. So it's. It's challenging, it's yeah, challenging. One thing I've always thought about the department structure is if you were gonna start from scratch, you would never end up where it is today. Um, unlike for the antitrust division, for example, at least all of the antitrust lawyers eventually going to uh, report up to an, a single assistant attorney general. So if there is a desire for consistency throughout the country, there's some effort, to con there's some ability to control the consistency. In the U.S. attorneys, we have 93 U.S. attorneys in the U.S. Attorney's offices, there's 93 U.S. attorneys, none of whom are even fireable by the Attorney General. And we have a criminal division who doesn't supervise the U.S. attorneys either. So they I think, think they, <laughs> they, right. yeah. they try to. <laughs> but there's also a backdrop, right? I mean, you guys are you know, filing your sentencing memo. You're certainly citing other cases. If it's, if it's inequitable in terms of charging, but certainly in the sentencing, you try to get that consistency. And I think the judges generally look at that. I was a practitioner, you know, in the defense, white collar defense, I was in your shoes about a little over a year ago, and that's what I used to do. And I, I, th I thought the judges generally kind of respond to try to even out some of the inequities if, you, if you're able to do that. I, I think that's a fantastic question, and that's something um, that uh, at least our office has been focused on uh, over the last uh, almost a year. There's a couple of formal programs. Um, you know, I, in, in my mind, it's most important to um, educate the public and outreach when it comes to the violent crime initiatives. Um, and 
So there's a couple of formal programs in the Project Safe Neighborhoods 2.0 2 um, that include um, uh, education and assistance with, with uh, reentry efforts. Uh, there are some programs designed specifically uh, to go into schools to educate um, school-aged children on an appropriate interaction with law enforcement. Uh, you know, things like that that we um, are doing more and more of. Um, there is some additional funding that uh, will be coming down soon through grants that's going to allow us to do more of that. Um, so there, there's that side of it. There's also um, I think that historically, uh, a lot of U.S. attorneys' offices have done a poor job with their uh, with media relations, with letting the public know what we're doing. Um, and so, our office has uh, enhanced our media policy. We've hired a media relations uh, coordinator. We now issue press releases uh, when we do things that involve community outreach uh, or roll out of new programs. We issue press releases. Uh, at indictment, at change of plea, and at sentencing to let the, the taxpayers know what their Department of Justice is doing on a local level. But I think you've ab absolutely hit on something uh, that is critical for, in my mind, every U.S. Attorney's Office that's going to be successful in completing the mission um, to become more and more um, involved with the community and, and, and to, more importantly, publicize those efforts so that folks know what we're doing. And there's grant money, and we have obviously have community partners as part of uh, PSN that, that actually work with, with community members. And in the, in the white collar world, I mean, I think you'll see us, the U.S. attorneys at least, um, go out and speak to different groups, uh, business groups, to talk about the type of things that we're doing, how people get in trouble. I'm speaking to a law school class on compliance, um, and, you know, I've done tons of, you know, cases or, and speeches on uh, co chambers of commerce, rotary clubs. To kind of tell them all the things that that, that we are doing um, in the white collar space. That's kind of what we do, and I think hopefully it filters down, and I think it does, particularly in the fraud and identity fraud, those type of cases. And we explain to them about cybersecurity and things like that. It does um, educate the public on on the the breadth of all the cases that we do and and, and how we try to reduce crime. There's a, there's a lot of competition for news, so sometimes it's hard to get notice. <laughs> hey. Uh, I want to thank the panel. This has been a really fun discussion for me. I hope it has been for you. Appreciate everybody's time and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you.